Corporal? You're letting us ride today? Not yet. There's a lot more you boys will have to learn before you do much riding. The work today will be on the military seat. But why, Corporal? You taught us how to saddle, unsaddle, and then bridle a horse. Well, let's see what you've learned, Hall. What would you name the various parts of the saddle? Seat, kettle, pommel, sidebars, girth, skirt, stirrup, straps, stirrup. OK, Corporal? That's right. Weston, how about you naming the various parts of the bridle? Well, reins, curb bit, snaffle bit, curb chain, uh, crown piece, brow band, uh, throat latch. I got the important parts of the bridle. The cheek pieces, the dune straps, length strap. But you did pretty well. well. We get a little closer to that ride Hall so anxious to take. Today we'll start our mounted work. To give you an idea what we're heading for, watch that platoon march by. That's pretty smooth riding, Corporal. You bet it is. It's all in knowing how. First thing I'm going to do is put you on your horse, Hall. And I'm going to make sure you get on the right way. Smith, you haven't forgotten what you learned in your recruit days about getting on a horse, have you? I guess not. All right, then get your horse and bring him around to this side of the picket line. Give me that pointer I was using yesterday, will you, Alan, please? Up this way, men. I want you to notice how Smith leads his bridled horse. He takes the reins off the neck and holds them in the left hand at the end. The right hand a few inches from the bits. The reason for this is that the horse becomes playful and starts acting up he can shift both hands to the ends of the rein, keeping out of the way of the teeth and forefeet, but still retaining control of his horse. We'll start with the position of we'll stand a horse. To take that position, place the reins back on the neck near the withers. Come to attention opposite the horse's head on the left side. Then with the right hand nails down, grasp the reins about six inches from the bits, the forefinger separating the reins. Thanks, Alan. To mount, he faces to the right, drops the right rein, takes one step to the horse's rear. See how that brings him opposite the left shoulder. Next, he half faces to the right, takes the reins in the left hand, separated by the little finger, with the bite falling to the right or off side. Then adjust the reins to get a gentle even bearing on the horse's mouth. And place the left hand on the crest near the withers. Place the left foot in the stirrup, assisted by the right hand if necessary. The left knee is firmly pressed against the saddle, but the toe must be depressed and kept from contact with the horse's side. The right hand grasps the cantle of the saddle. This is the position of prepare to mount. Upon the command mount, spring upward from the right foot, at the same time using your arm, especially the left one to aid you. Putting as little pressure as possible on the right to avoid pulling the saddle out of place. When you get in that position, Smith, hold it. I have a few more points I want to show. Note how he sprang rather than pulled up. His toe remained clear of the horse's side. Now see that in this position, the knee is firmly pressed against the saddle. Right foot beside the left, body inclined over the horse. Hold it there, Smith, while we pass around to the offside. See how the arms support most of the weight? The left hand on the crest, right hand on the cantle. You really pause here for only an instant, completing the mount by moving the right hand from the cantle to the pummel. Pass the right leg over the croup, but be careful not to touch him. Then sit down lightly in the saddle. All right, Smith, do it. The only thing that's left now is to place the right foot in the stirrup, adjust the reins. All right, Corporal. I've got that. Shall I try it now? No. No, not quite yet, Hall. I'd hate to leave you stuck up there. So I guess I'd better show you how to dismount first. You shouldn't have any trouble with that, because it's exactly the reverse of mounting. At the command, prepare to dismount. Grasp the reins in the left hand, as they were when the mounting was completed. Place that hand upon the crest. Right hand on the pummel. Remove the right foot from the stirrup. This is the position of prepare to dismount. The weight is shifted slightly to the left, as we can see by moving around to the rear of the horse. 
Okay, Smith. That shift to weight enables Smith to complete the dismount without further preliminary movement. Now hold the intermediate position again, Smith. And the rest of you come over here and see what it looks like from this side. In actual practice, you'll barely hesitate in this position. But he's now holding it to show you that it's the same one he assumed halfway through the mount. Feet together, body inclined over the horse. From here, you'll drop lightly onto the right foot, being sure not to press the left toe against the horse's side. And assume the position, stand a horse. Smith will now demonstrate the movements of mounting and dismounting without the pauses which we use for instructional purposes. Watch the complete smooth movement. Prepare to mount. Mount. Prepare to dismount. Dismount. Now let's see what it looks like on the offside. Prepare to mount. Mount. Prepare to dismount. Dismount. All right. Are there any questions? Nope. Now get your horses and we'll lead to the riding ring. Smith, lead them around this way, face them into the fence over there. Turn this way and stand a horse. Erwin, you're holding those reins too far down. Remember, six inches from the bits. Alan, you're supposed to be at attention. Stand up there. That's better. Prepare to mount. Left hand on the horse's crest, not the saddle, Chapman. Well, get that left knee against the saddle hall. You'll be off balance if you try to mount from there. Besides that, you're kicking your horse in the ribs. That's fine, Kennedy. Don't try to hurry it, Weston. Use your right hand to turn the stirrup so you can place your foot into it easily. That's right, good. Watch it, Weston. Sit down on that saddle more gently. You'll be doing this in formation. We don't want one horse messing things up because you've scared him half to death. Okay, Corporal. I'm up here. Now, how do you make the animal go? You don't yet, Hall. There are a few things about staying in the saddle I have to show you first. Your left stirrup strap is twisted, Chapman. Due to your turning it the wrong way. The strap should lie flat against the boot. Prepare to dismount. Dismount. That was good. Now we'll put the horses back in the picket line and start studying the military seat. Smith, you stay here. The proper military seat is one of the most important things you'll have to learn. So we'll go into it in great detail. 
Try to get a complete picture of how this man looks. This is the military seat. It has four principal elements. The rider's upper body, his legs, his base of support, and his balance. The upper body includes everything from the hip joints up. The leg is considered to be that part between the knee and the ankle. The base of support is formed by those parts of the rider's body in contact with the saddle and horse. From the points of the buttocks, down along the inside of the thighs, inner knees, legs, and feet. Notice that the fleshy parts of the buttocks don't form part of the seat, but are forced to the rear, out of the way. What uh, part's easy enough to remember, but how do you know when all these parts are in balance? Well, you'll learn to feel balance when you start riding, Paul. But the main thing to remember at this time is that to be in balance, the center of gravity of the upper body must remain as nearly as possible over or slightly ahead of the center of a space of support. Balance must be entirely independent of the hands and reins. Now I'll show you this seat in a little more detail. Notice that this man sits with his crotch squarely in the center of the saddle. With his weight distributed forward, from the points of the buttocks onto his crotch and down into the inner thighs, knees, and feet. When at the halt, like this, the upper body is bent slightly forward from the hips a little in front of the vertical. This puts the center of gravity in front of the points of the buttocks and ensures correct placing of the thighs and proper distribution of weight. What about the thighs, Corporal? Do you make any attempt to grip with them? No. No, if you're seated properly, you don't have to. Let me show you what I mean. If you do grip with the thighs, without a compensating grip with the calves, you get a clothespin effect, like this. And wind up on your ear like the clothespin did. If you grip hard with both your thighs and your calves, you're merely tiring yourself out with no benefit. With this seat, the thighs are forced down. The large, fleshy muscles are forced to the rear, the flat part is allowed to envelop the horse without any muscular constraint at all. A proper proportion of the rider's weight is easily distributed from here to here, and there isn't even a tendency to grip. Properly placed thighs naturally and correctly place the knees. They are forced down as low as the adjustment of the stirrup will permit, without causing the stirrup strap to hang in the rear of the vertical. They are neither limp nor stiff, nor is there normally any effort to pinch with them. Keep the knees flexed and relaxed, but in continuous contact with the saddle. Now, unless there are any more questions, we'll take a few minutes off to let this sink in and give our model a chance to stretch his legs. Wake up, Smith. School's out for a few minutes. I wasn't asleep, Corporal, just comfortable. This is the first time in my life I ever got paid for just sitting and not moving. I was enjoying it. Well, we'll give the horse a rest anyway. You can go and sit in the shade if you like. We'll be back in a few minutes because I'll need you again. All right, Smith, you can mount up again. Now I'll show you men a few more things about this seat. Pay special attention to the position of Smith's legs. They extend downward and backward, with the calves in light, flexible contact with the horse. They'll naturally fall in this position if the knees are kept flexed and relaxed. The contact you get with the calves this way is a means of communication with your horse, as well as an aid to security in the saddle. All right, Smith, you trot around now. Watch how his legs remain in position and maintain the contact. If you lose contact with your legs, your seat will become insecure. You lose the means of communication with the horse. 
Your swingy legs will only confuse and irritate him. Okay, Smith, you can come on back. Notice that the stirrup leathers are approximately vertical. Now, Smith, without disturbing the position of your knees, take your feet out of the stirrups and let them hang naturally. Now observe, the tread hangs opposite the lower level of the ankle bone. Of course, this is not a fixed rule. In the confirmation of both horse and rider, they call for a slight modification. All right, Smith, take your stirrups. Note the position of the foot. The ball of the foot is in front of the center of the stirrup tread. The heels well down. Note the ankles. They break slightly to the inside. They should be relaxed and flex freely with the movements of the horse. Are there any more questions now before I go on? I can't see any difference between the position of the upper body and that of a dismounted soldier at attention. Is there any? That's a good point, Irwin. The only difference is that a mounted soldier is slightly inclined forward from the hips. Maybe I'd better illustrate. Army riders aren't supposed to be contortionists. Just remember the position of your feet and legs. And the action of the joints while mounted are the same as those of a dismounted man of normal physique. Now watch closely while I stand on this board. I'm taking the normal mounted position while dismounted. The two by four being just like the stirrup tread. See how the balls of my feet rest upon it. My toes are relaxed and turned out at about the same angle as when I'm walking. This is important because it allows the hip and knee joints to work freely in the regular, normal way. Now all of you stand up with your legs spread out like this. Toes turned out at an exaggerated angle. Now try to lower the upper part of the body by bending at the hips and knees. You see how hard it is? Also, with the toes turned out too much, the horse's body prevents contraction of the knee joint. Now put your toes at an angle you use while walking. And see how easily these two joints work. See how my ankles are relaxed to allow my heels to drop below the level of the stirrup tread. This is important. The heels must be kept down at all times in order to ensure a secure and balanced seat. My hip, knee, and ankle joints are free to move in directions which are possible when mounted. By contraction or relaxation of the muscles controlling these three joints, I can obtain any degree of spring or elasticity I desire. between the stirrup tread and upper body. This point may not appear important now, but you'll see its great value when you come to really tough riding. There are a few more things I want to call to your attention. As yet, I haven't told you much about the use of the arms. Normally, the arms, elbows, wrists, and fingers are relaxed, with the elbows falling naturally. As long as your horse is going as desired, you need only use enough muscular energy to keep the arms in their proper position and maintain the reins securely. A natural relaxation of the arms ensures freedom and quietness in the use of the hands. This is very important because any involuntary contraction communicates itself to the horse's mouth. Show that, Smith. The immediate result is the loss of that calm confidence that the horse should always have in his rider. So far, it makes a lot of sense. Is there any change when the horse is in motion, Corporal? Only a very slight change, Weston. Smith, walk your horse in a circle around us. With a horse in motion, the rider should maintain a lightly stretched rein. At the same time, by relaxation of the arms and hands, he permits the normal movement of the horse's head. At the walk, the knees, legs, ankles, and thighs remain fixed in position. The upper body, which is the unstable part of the rider's mass, remains in balance by leaning a little more to the front. Take up the slow trot, Smith. The faster the pace, the more the upper body must bend forward to keep in balance. The lower thighs, knees, and legs remain in close contact with the horse. 
The knees, ankles, and heels sink at each stride, absorbing part of the shock and fixing the rider securely in the saddle. Now let's see the gallop. The seat is exactly the same at the gallop, except that as you see, the upper body is inclined even further forward to stay over its base of support. And here's another point to remember. As you speed up your gait, it becomes increasingly important to keep your hip, knee, and ankle joints free and elastic. That'll be all for now, Smith. And you men can have a rest. My purpose in assembling you here is to check up on your understanding of the military seat. This man will act as our model and will take such positions as we indicate. Hall, what do you think of his present position? He looks kind of high and seated on the end of his backbone. Yes. He's not deep enough in the saddle. He'd carry too much weight in the cantle, where the horse is least able to bear it. Suppose you adjust the thigh and knee. That's good. Weston, what do you think of his back? Well, he's too straight up and down. He should lean forward a little. Fine, fix it. That's good, but he'd maintain that position better if he'd hold his chin up and stiffen his lines a little. Irwin, his leg is out of place. Let me see you fix it. Fine, Irwin. You seem to have an excellent understanding of body position. Now, while you're here, put the arm in place and adjust the rein. Anyone see anything wrong? Well, I think, sir, that the forearm and rein should be in a straight line. Correct. Let's move the hand down into the proper position. Do you like the position of his fingers? They're too stiff, sir. Right. Release those fingers. We mustn't choke the reins, but have a soft feel like this. Now I want to show you how the weight distribution is affected by slight changes of body position. First the correct position. Then change to too far back, behind the horse at the hall. Watch the slight shift to obtain correct placing. At the trot, lean slightly forward. A little bit more for the gallop. That's enough. Corporals, mount your squads and work on position mounted. All, I want you to mount and trot around the ring. Watch Hall's knee. See how he has it stiff and straight. Now that forces his stirrup forward and his buttocks back on the cantle. He bounces rather than sits in the saddle. Relax your knee joint, Hall. Now it's too loose. It has dropped too low and forces the stirrup to the rear. See how he has slipped forward in the saddle and is now riding on his crotch. Come on in now, Hall. I want to point out a few more things about the knees, and this is important. If your knee is wrong, your whole seat is wrong. Remember to keep the knees relaxed. See how a tightly clamped knee like this turns the calf out. That in turn causes the loss of contact required both for the steadiness of the leg and for proper transmission of signals to the horse. On the other hand, when the knee is turned out like this, it loses contact pulls the flat part of the thigh away and it makes the ladder roll round in a large round muscle. That is what caused Hall's knee to drop and his stirrups to go to the rear. Now, Hall, pull the fleshy part of your thigh to the rear and turn your knee in until both it and your calf have contact. 
This is the correct position. And if you will keep it there without making it rigid, your leg and thigh troubles will end. Now I want all of you to mount and take the correct military seat. are too stiff, Irwin. That brings your heels up too high and makes your legs unsteady. If you tried to ride like that, you spend half your time losing your stirrups. Your toes are turned too far out, Alan. That tends to stiffen the ankle and force the heels back. You lose contact with the knee. Good, Weston. Your heels are well down and you have a strong seat. Watch those toes, Kennedy. It's just as bad to have them turned in too far as out too far. I want a few of you men to ride around the ring. Paul, Weston, Allen, take a track to the left. Range in both hands. Watch the balance of your upper body, Alan. You're leaning too far to the rear, sitting on the fleshy part of your buttocks. Keep a slight hollow in the small of your back. Your whole posture is wrong, Hall. When you round your shoulders that way, you cramp your chest. Your back slumps and your elbows have a tendency to fly out. Keep your head and chest up. Weston, you naturally have a pretty good seat, but you mustn't bend too far forward at the hips. Right in. Alan, right over this way. I want to point out something. This is the picture of the properly seated trooper, which you should carry away with you. This position can be broken down into six important points, which you must remember. First, the rider's head, back, and loins are held naturally erect, with the loins slightly concave. Second, the body is slightly inclined forward from the hip joints. Third, the buttocks are well to the rear, with the rider's weight distributed evenly onto his crotch, thighs, and stirrups. Fourth, the reins are lightly stretched with the hands relaxed and the elbows elastic so that the horse has liberty of head and neck. Fifth, knees and heels well down. Sixth, the foot is properly placed in the stirrup, almost home. Learn these points and put them into practice. When someone sees you coming, they'll know you're a horseman and you'll know it too. Now I want you to ride back to the stable, watching your seat carefully. Are you satisfied, Hall? Oh, I'm satisfied, all right. I'm just afraid I'm not quite as picturesque as I thought I might be, though. You may not be picturesque yet, but at least you're starting to learn how to ride properly. When you do get that picture to send to your girl, it won't look as though a good strong wind would blow you out of your saddle. Now get that hump out of your back, and we'll go in. <laughs> 